I'll give it to you in a moment.
The piece you heard was written by a woman named Hildegard of Bingen. H-I-L-D-E-G-A-R-D, Hildegard, that's how it sounds, of Bingen, B-I-N-G-E-N. -E and this piece was Columba Aspexit, C-O-L-U-M-B-A, A-S-P-E-X-I-T, Columba Aspexit. Not going. I remember this happened last time when I tried to do this. Let me try again. Here we go. Is this big enough you can read it on the back around there? So this is a little brief bio about Hildegard of Bingen. She lived around the year 1098 to 1179. She was sainted and became a doctor of the church in 2012. Um, she was a German Benedictine abbess, so she lived as a cloistered nun, you know, within the walls of, of her abbey. And she was very well educated in science, music, philosophy, and theology. In order to become a doctor of the Catholic Church, you have to have contributed in some meaningful way towards science. And her study of botany and natural selection, um, plant classification, um, also her study of, of scripture, of the languages, of theology, um, philosophy and how we understand the world. She was a very prolific um, writer. And she was also a composer. Um, she would have these mystical visions and she would write down words and songs and tunes that came to her. And she was perhaps, you know, one of the most prolific writers and is certainly now one of the most recorded medieval artists because they have found all of these transcripts of her music that she wrote. But during her lifetime and for, um, a while after, it was only ever heard in her monastery. Like the music that she wrote was just for the nuns there. It wasn't to go out on tour. They didn't have concerts in big palaces or anything like that. Um, so the fact that there is all this huge amount of information that we know about her and about all of her music, um, several people have done contemporary arrangements and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, some people suggest that the visions she had were caused by a medical condition, perhaps it was like migraine headaches, um, perhaps there were other health issues that she had, but no one really knows. But when she would have these visions and she would write it down, there's a picture here of her writing on a, a clay tablet. They would inscribe stuff on there using a pen and ink. And then you can see the Holy Spirit fire coming down, you know, into the front of her face right there as a sign of her divine inspiration, her encountering the sacred. So she has become the patron saint of creativity. So in the Catholic Church, there's a patron saint for everything, you know, and the patron saint of creativity is Hildegard of Bingen. So if you would like to know more about her, um, I have the CD um, up here. You can come and look at it. There's also a photocopy of the Latin and the English translation if you'd like to read the words. Um, the words aren't super meaningful, like they're kind of cryptic. Um, for example, this one starts off with Columba Aspexit, actually means the dove peered in through the lattice of the window where before its face a balm exuded from incandescent maximin. The heat of the sun burned dazzling in the gloom whence a jewel sprang forth in the building of the temple of the purest loving heart. He, the high tower constructed of Lebanon, wood and cypress has been adorned with 
hyacinth diamonds, a city excelling the crafts and other builders. And so they kind of go back and forth talking about Jesus or these visions of St. Ursula. Um, and she would write these wonderful songs about them. So if you'd like to look more into that or look at the CD, that'll be for you. Uh, I have a question. Yes. I mean, I would have guessed as they were singing that it was Scottish. I thought I heard bagpipe at the very base. Mm -hmm. So I would have guessed Scottish. So they were actually singing it in Latin. Correct. Yes. Okay. So in Germany at that point, was Latin the language or only the language of religion? Did they speak German, but in religious terms, it was all Latin? Correct. Yeah. At this time, they would have spoke old German, I think. Um, but uh, the language of the church was all in Latin. So, so the Bible they were reading was the Latin Vulgate translation that Jerome had written around 300 uh, around 400 AD was the Latin Bible, and that was sort of what they used for instruction, for catechism, um, anything about God or theology. When priests would write edicts and stuff like that, it was always in in Latin, and that way doctrines of the church could be promulgated throughout the Christian Empire. So anywhere from, you know, Scotland, Germany, Italy, out to Turkey, as long as you were writing in Latin, you know, the whole church could sort of understand what was going on. Uh, but I don't know exactly. Peered in, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in a in a nunnery is probably the only place where such creativity could be cultivated. She may have been from a very wealthy family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she may have come from a wealthy family, um, educated and that sort of stuff ahead of time before going into the room. All right. All right, well now let's get into the Book of Kells. So this is an actual picture of the Book of Kells. Um, you can see it's actually got a more contemporary board cover and some of the binding might look fairly new. That was from a recent restoration in the 1950s when they actually rebound the book. Um, but this is about what it looks like. It's about 13 inches by nine inches. So you imagine, you know, a little bit bigger than, you know, these pages that we're holding right here. Um, have this great book. They've got, some pages have full page illumination manuscripts. Some of them have decorative text on them. Other pages will have just um, words and text, which is a majority of the pages. Oftentimes we think of Illuminated manuscripts, we only think of these big decorative pages, but if you look on the handout, that bottom middle page is actually what a majority of the Book of Kells looks like. It's text with fancy letters here and there, but otherwise it's all just the scripted text. It's all in Latin um, and all that sort of fun stuff. So before we get too into talking about the Book of Kells itself, where did I put my... Well, I set it down somewhere between here and my office. I know I picked it up. All right. Well, here, let's go ahead and turn to Psalm 119. Here, I got, I've got a version on my phone here. It's not quite as holy, but it's still the same text. So. And if you've got a Bible or an app on your phone, we'll go ahead and turn to Psalm 119. And it's kind of a long one. So we're going to verse 97 through 106. So does someone have that they'd be willing to read these few verses for us? Thank you, Mary. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders. For I obeyed your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. Yes. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and the light of my path. I have taken an oath 
and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. All right, thank you. At 105, 106, there's many songs, I think. Mm -hmm. So in this passage here, we have the psalmist talking about meditating day and night. Your words are sweet to taste, sweeter than honey. But a lot of it is about reading, reading the Bible, meditating, contemplating. So how do you meditate on the word of God? If you had to say to yourself, how do I fit into this picture? How would you describe meditating on the word of God? A lot of times when I'm praying, uh, truth comes to mind. Or mm -hmm. if I'm reading the Bible, uh, even if you know, like we have the text for your sermon, I will be thinking about not just that text, but related texts. Yes, to have that scripture knowledge to come back. So as you meditate on it, you're informed by other passages of scripture that come to mind. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when I'm reading the Bible, all of a sudden there'll be a historical text to it. I'm going to go and look at the different aspects of it in different verses, kind of books of the Bible. Mm -hmm. I have something in the New Testament that refers to the Old Testament. And so I want to spend, instead of spending 10 minutes, I spend an hour and a half. All right. Sometimes I think of music into my feet when I have the bright scripture in mind. Just having it set to music. There are songs that are set to music. Yeah. That's a nice way to do it. Sit and listen and just have the music kind of come across you and think about it. Mm-hmm. Daily devotions are nice. They're they're structured. They're Something to think about and ponder, a way to guide your day. All right, how is the Bible like a lamp to our feet? This is a very concrete image here of a lamp to our feet. Your feet are your foundation. <clears throat> Light is the holy word. The word of God is here in front of us in our Bible. So the light should open our minds and our hearts to absorb what's in truth. Mm -hmm. It lights the way forward. Lights the way forward. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of you have ever gone camping or been out somewhere where you needed a flashlight, you know, it's one thing to shine the flashlight way off in front of you so you can kind of get a lay of the land, but then oftentimes you kind of forget like what's right in front of you. So then you shine the flashlight right down at your feet. You know, you're thinking if you've got just a candle, you know, like they did with these olden days, you know, they have a lantern and like, if you're out and it's pitch dark in the black, like you're holding that thing down close to your feet so you don't trip on a rock or step in a hole or something. You know, I think of it, you know, and that sort of sense there too. So the last question here is, what is the sweetest thing in your life? And how is the Bible sweeter? I guess my marriage. Hmm? My marriage. Your marriage? Mm -hmm. Probably the sweetest thing in my life. And yet the, the, the relationship with God is, is so perfect. When, when I obey, <laughs> that's the hard part. And the Bible is always there. God is always there. You can always reach. And other things you can't always reach. They're not ready. There's a song we used to sing in the, in the Sunday school assembly. It was God's never too busy, never get the answer, and you're calling God. <laughs> <laughs> you can always read them. It's always there. All right. 
yeah, I know for me, you know, most of us would say, you know, our family, our friends, you know, those are the sweetest things that we get to have, you know, big, you know, holiday dinners, you know, but then how is the Bible sweeter? And I think for my own self, the idea that the sweetness that I enjoy with my family is but for a lifetime, right? When I was born, when I die, um, and relationships come and go, you know, traditions come and go, and sometimes holidays aren't all that they're cracked up to be, you know, and but when I think of God's goodness throughout the centuries, and I think of, you know, people a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago, and like you said, you know, God's always with them. God's never too busy. And sustaining people that thought God was good enough that they wanted to tell their children about it. And that goodness that has brought us to where we are today. The idea that, okay, God's, God's word really has sustained people and brought us, you know, this far. It might not be sweet as in like happy and bubbly, like we might think when he talks, when the psalmist writes about, you know, sweeter than the sweetest honey. You know, if we think, you know, it's more, more fulfilling, more satisfying than anything we've ever felt. You know, to me, that might resonate a little more than something that's just sweeter. Now, I know if all of you had, you know, your Bibles encrusted with jewels and hand lettered by monks over, you know, years and years, <laughs> you two might meditate on it a little bit more spiritually. So we'll go ahead and we'll turn a little bit now to our. Yes. What's the date of this? The Book of Kells. No one knows exactly when it was written. Um, it was probably sometime around the year 800 AD um, uh, is when it was, wait, they think it was um, 800, 900. Um, it's called the Middle Ages, you know, the High Middle Ages. The, there was a man, um, well, here, I'll start with the background here. So it's called an illuminated manuscript. Um, and the illumination is a double meaning. It, one sense means, you know, illuminated by Christ, like we have the prayer for illumination before we do our scripture reading. So these manuscripts are often called illuminated um, because it has been inspired by God um, in, a, in a theological and a spiritual sense. But in the literal sense, the illumination is the coloring, the decor decorations, the designs um, that you see in, in here. So when people talk about just manuscripts, it's just writing, but if it's an illuminated manuscript, it is a divine writing. It is a divine manuscript that has been imbued with these pictures and designs and decorations and stuff like that. Uh, yes. How many people would be able to see something like this? In those, that day and age? I mean, where was it kept? Was it viewed by anybody or? Tip, it. Typically, um, it would have been kept up on an altar um, or in a, a side chamber of the sanctuary that they would have um, at the church. And depending on the frequency, they would pull it out and they would probably do a procession and they would hold it up so that the congregation could see it. Similar to the way, you know, you might see, you know, the Pope when he does Christmas Eve service, he walks in carrying the Gospel of Matthew or something like that. Um, um, sometimes they would have display stands up on the altar table and they would put it up there as kind of like the center point um, when it wasn't in use during worship they would um, they had special boxes that they would put it in um, holy boxes that were also similarly decorated that they would keep the manuscript gospels in uh, for protection to keep it away from mice and rodents and stuff spilling on it um, but not many people would actually read it other than the priests and the scribes um, um, and like the lawyers and stuff like that who would consult the bible and, and do stuff like that the commoners couldn't really read Latin anyway, so for them, a Latin Bible wouldn't be something they're like, oh, hey, look, Dominus es veritus, like it wouldn't be very helpful for them. So in some ways, it was um, vis a visual thing so people could see it, uh, but not necessarily meant to be read by, by the common people. No, and, you know, back in the year 800, you know, 1,000, you know, people didn't travel, you know, they you know, some people would do pilgrimage to see different relics and that sort of stuff. Um, so those people would be able to see it. So this actually was written, it's up in the University of uh, Dublin. Um, I have a link for it at the end of this. And I'll send this slideshow out to everybody after class so you can 
review it and anybody who misses it can see it. Um, there was a guy named St. Columba in 512 who was credited with uh, going to the British Isles to actually bring Christianity there. And he sort of inspired this idea of um, writing a Bible and having the Celtic designs put in it. So several people have kind of debated whether or not the Book of Kells was actually written, like started by St. Columba and like his immediate disciples, or if it was a couple of years or a couple hundred years later, the first written recollection of it, um, of where it is, was written around the year 1000 AD. Um, so they think it was sometime a couple hundred years before that, um, but when it exactly was, they don't know. Um, there's ideas that it was written to commemorate when St. Columba colonized, so it was like a commemoration to him, um, or some people say that uh, it was commissioned by various groups to put together for this big church that they were gonna build. Because if you know the series of time, um, or the monastic life at the time is that you had these monks living in these cloistered abbeys. Um, this was also the time of Viking raids. Um, it was, you know, plagues were, were rampant. You know, there was not really a, a knowledge of science um, other than, you know, leeches and alchemy. There was no, you know, real, science, you know, as we would think of it today, or, or medicine. So they're very much were um, religious healing services for people. There was lots of prayer, a lot of mystical mysticism. Um, this is around the same time, you know, as Hildegard of Bingen. So the main music in the church were these single melody Gregorian chants that people would hear. Um, so that is, um, and also literacy being very low. Uh, unless you were clergy um, or a priest or a scholar, 90% um, of the world, you know, in this time, like, wouldn't be able to read, uh, let alone read Latin. You know, it was you know, very farming, agrarian, stone cutters, you know, sheep farmers, you know, sort of British Isle fun stuff. So the physical attributes of this book, um, they're folded sheets of vellum called folios. So there's like a single page, you know, that's, they're all stacked up and then they're bound together in the middle so that they're folded in half. Um, it's 680 pages total. So they would put a stack of vellums together, fold them in half the same way you'd bind a book today. You know, you take a stack, fold them up, take another stack, fold them up, and then you take all those folded stacks and then you bind them all together in a big, massive, you know, collection. And originally it was the four gospels all bound together in a big single book. Um, over the years, um, Again, you know, this book is a thousand years old. So um, in the year 1200, it was, it was rebound again um, and redecorated. Some thieves had ripped the covers off, so they had to recreate the cover. Um, some of the pages had been lost or destroyed over time. And then some publisher had the great idea to rebind them and to trim the edges of the pages so that they'd all be the same pages. So they all be the same size. So some of the pages have all been cropped where some of the designs have actually been lost because of these, you know, previous book bindings that have, you know, tried to make it look uniform and nice. Um, it is the Latin Vulgate um, in terms of the translation, but the people who wrote this pulled from other Latin sources that predate the Vulgate. So there's actually a couple different translations that are woven into this particular copy of the Bible. So when you read it, it doesn't exactly line up with other Latin Vulgate translations you might see. And of course, there are different theologians that postulate, you know, where they pulled this from or where they would have pulled that from or why they would have used this translation instead of that one. Um, ultimately, there's no real way to know um, other than the fact that there are slight differences in terms of the word in there. Um, the cover, of course, you know, was covered with jewels. It had gold. They used gold leaf in some of the decorative pages. This was, of course, the word of God. There was a TV show that came out four or five years ago called Vikings on History Channel. And I watched it for the first couple of seasons and kind of fell away. But the first season, it it's from the point of view of the Vikings and they go to sail west for the first time to go find this mythical England, you know, place. And they find it and there's this monastery. And of course they sack the monastery and there's, you know, gold crosses and candles and lampstands and, you know, all this other sort of stuff. And they, the Vikings are ransacking and they're pillaging everything. And they see this monk who's holding on to this Bible. It's not nearly as well decorated as this one. 
what the Vikings asked him, it was like, you know, of all the treasure, you know, because they're looking for gold, silver, you know, Joe's like, of all the treasure here, why are you protecting this book? And the monk says, because without the word of God, there is only darkness. And this Viking kind of was like, that just makes no sense. Like, why on earth would you, would you think that? And the, the story kind of is between this Viking and this monk then for the first seasons about his value system of believing in the one true God and the value of the word of God written in this book um, compared to all the jewels and the treasures and the gold that you know, the Vikings were able to take. So for the sake of having a gold and expensive cover, this was not just because they wanted a fancy item. This was the word of God. This was the holy way that they would encounter the sacred. This was how they encountered God was the priest would read the scriptures. The priest would pray for the people. And it became the sort of intercessory sort of way that in order for the priest to access God was through this divine holy book of the Bible. So the people would want to contribute that the priest could have the best Bible. They could have all of this wonderful resources. Um, Did the monks have wealthy benefactors? Did they have all of these jewels? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the, the theology of the time, um, which is kind of where you get up into the Reformation with like the selling of indulgences and the sort of idea where you could buy your way into heaven. There were, there were benefactors who were wealthy landowners or estate holders that in order to make good with God would sponsor chapels, they would pay for churches, they would help buy buildings. And then the local common people, if you wanted to help, you know, your soul, you know, then you could help participate in lifting up the church. And it was, you know, I don't know all the tithing expectations of, of the ancient days, but but giving to the church was a very big part of um, solidifying your place in heaven and to show the rest of the world how faithful you were so you know the way people today sponsor sports arenas and put their names on buildings and stuff like that and the, in these days they would you know pay for a scribe to sit for a year you know and provide them with food and shelter and the resources that they needed several of the inks that they would use um, they've sourced have come down from south in the mediterranean down by greece and turkey um, so these these inks that they used way up in england were from all over Europe, you know, and they were very expensive to get and to maintain. So when you opened up this book and you saw these colors, oh my goodness, how gorgeous it would have been. I did an experiment one time when I was in college making natural pigments with stuff that I could find around my college campus. So I went and I found like the reddest berries I could find and I like smashed them up and I found like the bluest, you know, flowers I could find and I smashed them up and I tried mixing them with water and different stuff. And, and at the end of the day, it just kind of looked like a, like someone stepped on a piece of mud or something like that, because everything was just kind of like these very muted colors. There was a little bit of orangey, there was a little bit of bluish, you know, a lot of greens and browns. And I thought, you know, if I really wanted to make something like a vibrant red or a brilliant blue, like you really have to crush up stones, you know, precious stones and mix them with, you know, types of lacquer, or you have to find um, the purple cloth. Like there are special little mollusk, um, squid type things that you can find down in the Mediterranean. And if you squeeze them, you can get half a drop of this purple ink. And if you wanted to, you know, have enough ink to fill a jar, you know, even just a couple ounces to then paint, um, you can imagine how expensive and time consuming it would be to paint, to pay for the transportation, to get the inks, and then to have a scribe up there. It's like, okay, scribe, you get one chance to paint this up here. Um, so to do a vellum, that, to do 600 pages, obviously would take multiple people. Um, most scholars have identified that there are three primary artists that did the big pictures um, and three separate hands or four separate hands that have actually written the text of inscribing each different page there. Um, so if you look, um, here, I'll go to the next. So if you look here, um, you can see a lot of Celtic design. This is one of the cover pages that shows the four gospels. Um, yeah, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, respectively, but they're all interwoven with these woven knot patterns like the Celtic cross you might have seen in these Celtic designs um, are very much influenced by the region in which it is located. So if you look at other illuminated manuscripts from Germany or from Italy or from Spain, 
you know, they are, they all have their different traditions and their different motifs and designs. But the, the Book of Kells, particularly being up in Ireland and the British Isles, has lots of these anamorphic motifs. So there's lots of, think of like the Loch Ness monster type stuff, you know, and think of, you know, these serpents and different animals that are woven into these knots and designs. Mm. If you want to read up on Celtic knots, like they do have theology and meaning versus the types of knots and how they're woven. Um, it's not just decorative, but it actually has meaning of how things are tied together. Um, so to translate that into the gospel was a way for these people to say, we want to make this gospel something that is meaningful for the people here. So they, they incorporated all these local designs, these local traditions and customs. Um, so people think that the artists, you know, were from that area. They knew the history and the architecture and the styles. So when they put it together, they were actually able to use all these motifs um, so that it would be kind of like a local book, as if someone were to, if we were to illuminate a manuscript here in St. Louis um, to use images of, you know, rivers and bluffs, um, arches, you know, the arch, you know, the, this downtown city skyline, you know, different things like that, that people say, oh, this is from St. Louis, as opposed to someone that maybe does, you know, craggy cliffs and tall pine trees like the Pacific Northwest or sandy beaches and palm trees like if you were out in Florida. So the Celtic designs of the Book of Kells really does cement it in its location and it really does kind of give a great example of different types of artists. Um, so this particular page is very rectilinear, um, which means it's like a rectangle. It's very structured. You know, you've got compartments for the swirly designs, you've got Apartments for the four different gospel characters. Now, can you tell what those four animals are? It's not really super easy to see. Um, here's a close up of the, the top two. So, this is a man. This is technically a lion. It's got wings on it. I don't know if that is ringing any bells for you. And then on the bottom, there's an ox. You can see its legs kind of sticking out to the left there, and it also has some wings. And then this is an eagle standing there. So, I don't know if those animals sound familiar to you. The man, the ox, the. Well, the cow is, the cow is pink, right? Yes. Yes. It is pink? Mm -hmm. It's actually pink. Yeah, this is all pink. Not pink. Many, oh, many of the artists used just one hair on the bush. Mm -hmm. To do the different animals. Yeah. Like so there, there's, there's a mixture of different types of paints and inks that they would use. There's a mixture of different types of paints and inks that they would use, depending on the color that they wanted to get. So. I, I just use the same interchangeably, so. But yeah, so for some of these, you know, if you think to yourself, you know, this, let's see, which way we're gonna go there. You know, this whole page is roughly, you know, nine inches by 13 inches. So these guys right there, that's like the size of a note card. You know, if you were gonna paint on the size of a note card and you're getting these little circle designs and these little swirl motifs and these different colors with the overlapping, like that is, you know, like, Pat said, you know, you've got just a few, a hair or two hairs, you dip it in your ink and you slowly brush it along. It can be quite painstaking. So while one person's working on this page, you've got, you know, two or three other folks working on other pages and writing out the actual Bible verses and stuff like that. It's supposed to represent the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why is only one representative of actual human being? That's my question. Why, why the animal? So in... In the theology, the four animals are referenced in the book of Revelation um, and in the book of Ezekiel. There's images of angels that fly that have four heads, the head of a man, the head of a lion, the head of an um, ox, and then the head of an eagle. And people have interpreted that as symbols of the four gospels. So these four animals um, have become indicative of the four gospels writers. So the man is the Gospel of Luke. And if you read the Gospel of Luke, um, it's Jesus is a very earthly man. Like there's lots of talking, lots of healing, um, lots of feeding people. Um, there's, you know, when Jesus interacts with people, it's on a very human level. Um, Jesus is the one who comes to save, he serves. Um, when you come to the Matthew, or when you come to Mark, Jesus is. Um, the lion, you know, he is the one who comes to save. He is the one who is triumphant. He is the one who rebukes the Pharisees. He is the one who has power over death. Um, Jesus' portrayal is much more 
ferocious and, um, and powerful. So he has the symbol of the lion. And then when you get down here to the ox, uh, something that you would sacrifice, you come to the gospel of Matthew. And in Matthew's gospel, it's all about how Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. Like Moses, he has come to um, shoulder our burdens. He has come to die for us. He has come to complete the task that God had set up in the Old Testament sacrificial system where he has become the final sacrifice for us. Um, so Matthew's emphasis on Jesus is about how he is the fulfillment of this ancient prophecy, come to die for us. And then lastly is the eagle, and that's the Gospel of John. Um, when you talk about Jesus in the Gospel of John, Jesus is very lofty. I and the Father are one. He has lots of sayings about how I am going to the Father. Um, you cannot understand now. You cannot come with me now, but soon you will understand. Jesus breathes on his disciples to give them the Holy Spirit. And in this image of Jesus, you have a very holy and divine Jesus. So this image of the eagle is often used to depict the Gospel of John. So when you see these four animals as the four different gospels, as early back as, you know, 800 AD, they've kind of um, anthropomorphized each gospel writer and sort of given them each their own different focus to help differentiate the two. So that way, even if a person couldn't sit down and read all of the different gospels, they could tell, oh, this is the gospel of Matthew, or this is the gospel of John, and have a sense of who Jesus is based on these different gospels. So, Long answer for a short question there. So this is one of my favorite pictures of Jesus too, because he's blonde. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever seen a blonde Jesus. You know, he's got the brown beard, but he's got the golden flowing locks over there. And then you can see around all the different motifs. Um, you've got peacocks up at the top. Um, you've got different um, angels along the bottom, whether they're I don't know all the details of all the different icons and all the different paintings here, but sometimes they're, they're saints like Isaiah or Jeremiah. Um, sometimes they're scribes recording the word of God. So the question for us here then is to ask, is it sacred or is it not? So at the end of every class period, we'll have a chance to kind of talk about encountering the sacred through this piece of artwork. Is this illuminated manuscript created, you know, 1200, you know, years ago that has been looked at, read, studied, taken apart, put back together. So divinely delicately, you know, illuminated and written. Is this something sacred? Is this something that we can look at and encounter God in? True translation of God's word, no matter what they draw, unless it's absolutely uh, a sinful representation, like some of the stuff in India on the temples. Mm -hmm. I don't think that is the case here. Yeah, most of this stuff is fairly, you know, decorative or biblically based. So, come on in. Yes. Well, we're, we're, we're coming towards the tail end. We started at 930. That, that's all right. Let's there, you grab a packet right there and you can, you can join us for the end, the end bit here. I would consider it sacred because in the time it was created, as a general rule,
a way of worshiping God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for all the people that participated in making it. When we were out in California, we went to Getty Museum mm -hmm. and saw some of those illuminated books with the gold leaf, and it just, it's, yeah, you just can't believe the, the detail and the beauty of, of those books mm -hmm. and patience to sit there day after day after day. Yeah, and, you know, for a lot of these, you know, monks and stuff like that, you know, when you're up in the cold British Isles in, you know, 800 AD, you know, surrounded by sheep farmers and, you know, various different other, you know, locals. And it's like, okay, well, we're going to make this illuminated manuscript here. You get your candle and you get your brush and your inks and you just start, start going for it. And you got, you know, a team of other folks around that's, you know, double checking, making sure the script is right and everything. And for the act of all of them, like it is an act of, of devotion, of worship to oh, be able to dedicate it. I mean, there's no <laughs> doubt. 600 and something pages, she said. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. Yeah. Back at, in the 90s and into the beginning of this century, the uh, St. John's Abbey in Minnesota commissioned the first illuminated Bible in 500 years. And it was definitely an act of devotion. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's called the St. John's Bible. It's just beautiful. It's written in English. Uh, mm -hmm. and, yeah. You know, it's, it's, Where is it kept? It's in Minnesota, Collegeville, Minnesota. And it's called St. John. Well, it's called the St. John's Illuminated Bible. Uh, because it's at the, the Priory of St. John, and there's a college there as well, and they're the ones that commissioned it. So they got a bunch of scriveners and a chief right. illustrator to come in and help design it. And it's a very modern and contemporary. I have um, a couple volumes of, of those gospels, so I, I can bring those in next right. week. You and can you buy can take copies. It. So yeah, and you can buy copies of You wouldn't want to try to buy a copy of the entire Bible. Yeah. So we talked about if it's sacred, the act of doing it, the act of reading it, um, the act of participating in worship with it um, makes this a sacred, a sacred object. You know, would we say that it is art in our in our contemporary definitions? You know, is this something that you would say is a is a piece of art or a work of art? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they have a pattern. Because they just started from somewhere. This, how they made it the way it is. Yeah. You know, you think even Michelangelo, like you have the sketches of what he was doing. Mm -hmm. I wonder how they released it. So many people looked at them. There are some unfinished pages in there that aren't completed that have scratched outlines of what they had hoped to do for the different designs and stuff like that. So my guess is that they probably did make mock-ups ahead of time. And then by the time they actually went to the actual page, they knew hopefully what they were going to do. Mm -hmm. The questions don't imply this, but, but I mean, to me, it's both just like uh, the music we sing every Sunday. It's sacred music. It's, it's not just music for the sake of music. It's sacred music. It's sacred. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great, that's a great way to, to tie it together. So is that a copy of the book? Yeah, so uh, Pat, if you'd be all right, can we pass that around so folks could take a look? There are. Okay, it starts on page 23. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's on page 23. So in other words, in terms of coming up with where they came up with ideas for this, there were other illuminated manuscripts before this that had other designs and other decor um, that the monks probably had seen or the bishops had seen um, in their travels or they knew of, or they had seen copies and reproductions of. So by the time they're actually making this one, they'd probably seen a fair number of other possibilities of how other people had laid out designs and how other people had done their, their decor. And, and there stuff are some like. plates in there from other poetry. Yeah. yeah, like there's a another one from a, a little bit before this one called the Lindisfarne Gospels, mm -hmm. um, the Ebo Gospels, you know, other different ones that are simpler style, more geometric. Um, some of them are more medieval looking with like little castles and turrets and, you know, little people out in like farming attire type stuff, as opposed to this more abstract type design here. And a lot of it was similar to what was somewhat established. Uh, 
I'm looking at that picture and I see peacocks above his shoulder. Mm -hmm. um, there probably was a symbolism to that. You know, mm -hmm. had a meaning that you could probably find out. All the different knots around the outside look like they have peacock heads, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. So the the mass was often done in Latin. So when you come to church service, it was Latin. Correct. But the right. But I mean, but the priests would speak the local language outside of mass. So when they would do like prayers and visitation and out about in the community, like the priests would speak German, you know. And people could talk, and and he could, of course, explain what the scriptures meant and the stories meant, and so, and there were, um, there were enough people that knew the Bible stories uh, just from memory, so that we even if you couldn't read Latin, people knew the story of Adam and Eve of Abraham. You know, they knew the story of the Exodus. You know, they knew the story of Jesus, um, his crucifixion and death. Because when you go to high mass, you know, on the high holy days. It's one thing to just sort of sit there and listen to a bunch of, you know, gobbledygook, good, but, you know, to actually know what's going on. It's like, oh, okay, the 12 stations of the cross, people would know that this is what happened. You know, people would know about Monday, Thursday and Good Friday and the Saturday vigil and Sunday morning. So, so even though the Bible was in Latin, you know, access to the stories was not limited um, by that language barrier. All right. So just wanted to say thank you all for coming out. The, uh, is that the last one there? Yeah. All right. If you have any questions, like I said, I'll email this out. Um, and you can always Google the Book of Kells. Um, let me go back up and I'll show you actually a little bit here. So if you go to Trinity College in Dublin, um, or the entire book is actually online. It's really great. So if you actually just click this link, it takes a little bit to, to open up here, but once it does, my computer's been very slow because it was, was doing updates, but it actually has all 680 pages and you can actually just click through page at a time and you can see where the different pages um, come up here. So we'll see here how it comes up. So here you go. So here, there's a lot of frontis pages where it's got, lists of all the different, um, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the different family trees, different lineages, um, different stories and the different kings of scriptures and decorations for all these different things. But you can imagine over here, you can just kind of scroll down and you can see how many different pages there are. And then here's like what a majority of the book looks like, you know, these different pages. And like, I can kind of read Latin uh, a little bit, you know, at least the cognates, but because of the font they use, because of this Celtic font, it's very difficult to make out some of the languages. So even when I look at this, I'm like, is that a W or a U, like M-O, close? So it's, it's, it's hard for me to, to make it out, but if you want to go here and you want to take a look and see if you're going to brush up on your Latin and know what it was. Um, yeah. All right, well, why don't we go ahead and close with a prayer. Heavenly God, we give you thanks for this book, for your Bible, for your word, for the story of Jesus Christ, the way that it has sustained people in the darkness, the way that it has been a light to our feet. Lord, we pray that as we encounter you, Lord, afresh in new ways this day, that we would remember how you have encountered your people in the past. Thank you for the work and energy that went into creating this book, to keeping it safe over these thousand years, Lord, for the many people that have held it and touched it, read it and seen it, for the ways that you have inspired people from it. Um, Lord, we pray that you would continue to inspire us by your word, that you would continue to speak to us as new translations come out, as new Bibles are published and printed, that your word would continually be a lamp unto our feet, that we might be guided as we meditate upon them day and night. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. My apologies to the class. That's all right. All, all, all are welcome here.